Welcome to episode two of the Workflow Innovation Group's Brilliant or Bust podcast. Today's show is sponsored by Object Matrix, Vidispine, and Zixi. I'm Christy King, the host of this grand adventure. And I'm Nick Pierce, co-founder of WIG and Object Matrix. Thanks for joining us. So our last podcast, uh, which technically was our first podcast, has uh, done really well. We've actually gotten a lot of comments from people. Yeah, it's been brilliant. Um, the feedback that I've had is that very enjoyable. Uh, the industry really needs an open and honest voice right now uh, to overcome the bombardment of digital sales uh, efforts. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to uh, what's discussed today. One of the things that's been in the news a lot lately and oddly enough was something we've been talking about for one of the subjects of these podcasts turns out to be deep fakes. Everybody was pretty excited about this topic. So um, we've got someone from Adobe and somebody here from Sundog and some of the usual crew to dive in to talk about deep fakes. I'll be really interested to see where the conversation goes because obviously there's a technology side to this subject, but there's also a social side. Yeah. So um, I'm really keen to uh, get stuck in and, and see what statements we've got to uh, vote on today. Yeah, yeah. No, this should be great. I'm excited. Let's do this. Let's crack on. First up from Object Matrix, we have Nick Pierce. Hi, Christy. And next we have uh, Steve Sharman from the Workflow Innovation Group. Hi, Christy. And from Adobe, we have Mr. Steve Ford. Hey, Christy. And from Sundog, we have Rich Welsh. Hi, Christy. Thanks for having me. And last, but certainly not least, we have Ben Davenport from Vidispine. Watcha. Here we go. Editing is the original deep fake, brilliant or bust. What say you, Mr. Welsh? Well, I think if you, you're being very specific and narrow in defining deep fake, I would say that it requires you to use some sort of machine learning tooling, either deep learning or good old fashioned AI neural network learning, or probably some combination of them. A deep fake in its narrow sense is, is something that has uh, manipulated audio or video to create something that wasn't there before using machine learning. Also in terms of this statement, I'm happy to say that editing is the original deep fake. Mr. Sharman. <laughs> but essentially, it's um, a deep fake is producing an output that looks as if it's potentially completely artificial, but looks as if it's a um, it's a real person essentially saying things that that person wouldn't have said or um, or putting that person into compromising situations. I guess we've, um, we've we've all seen that kind of stuff around. Yeah, and it's not just the audio, uh, the video, and the audio. It could be other things. It could be components of what's going on in the scene. I mean, it's just yeah. the person anymore. So actually, creating a scene as well. That's really interesting. Putting people into a kind of a different context, like sort of taking an ordinary person, putting putting them at a Nazi rally, that kind of thing. I hadn't thought of that. Mr. Ford. The context. I was watching a thing last night. You know, they were trying to give the context that, you know, observers were being thrown out of the election room and that kind of stuff. From an edit point of view, all they did was just show somebody being thrown out. They didn't say why. They didn't say where, what the context was at all. Now, I think that's, I mean, you could fake anything out and change the entire story or the narrative yeah. based on what you put in front of somebody. I think what deep fake really means now to Rich's point is that you can more blatantly accomplish that and make something look some, like it's credibly authentic when in fact it's not. And that, I yeah, think it I takes the concept to a whole different level i think there's a i think it was a, fa a relatively famous incident in the um i think back in the, the 1984 miners strike and um and and i think it was said that the miners charged the police first uh, and caused a riot so i believe the num then then um, subpoenaed the footage um and it was proved from the time code that the um that the, actually the police charged first that i guess is one of those instances where the by going back to the um, the original data what was considered to be a very trusted source at uh, at that point, you can prove that, that that sequence of events was changed. With this machine learning technology, um, you can create something completely synthetic and it's very difficult to, to prove whether it actually happened or not. Yeah, I think that's, you know, one of the big challenges, I think, you know, to riff off of what you were just saying with the miners' strike, like when the, uh, there were massive protests as a result of George Floyd here in the US, Fox News was called out for putting, you know, somebody with a gun, like a, an armed yeah. militia person in Seattle when it was actually stock photography. Um, but the, what they had done is they had used AI for lighting. They had they used AI basically it's in, in our tools uh, from Adobe that basically made it look like that that mm. person to tell the narrative of what they were trying to say, you know, to, yeah. to really kind of reinforce it. Um, it looked like it was part of the scene and it wasn't until somebody came along and said, wait a second, that 
same guy has showed up in the exact same way in a different story, in a different place yeah. at a different time. That was indeed fake, and they had to recant it, which they did. And um, that was a know, news that channel. Yes, that was Fox News here in the U.S. I think what you and uh, and Rich have actually said just in the last kind of few minutes has uh, has actually changed my concern. Because I, I think in my mind there was I, I was quite fixated on this idea of you know creating a synthetic person or um, use machine learning to to create a very lifelike voice of of somebody from samples. But what you've both just pointed out is that actually just by applying some basic techniques, which may involve some deep learning and so on and so forth, in many ways, that's more powerful in the context. What do you think, Ben? Does then, do we have to think about deep fake as, as a purely technical term, which is something that is faked or synthesized based on deep learning? And then, I mean, that changes the whole conversation when it comes to morality and things, because then it clearly is the next step in editing when we talk about using AI for lighting and other things. Um, and, and really, it's about supporting the story, and it's the story that's fake. Mr. Pierce? It's not even AI in this statement, is it? I mean, because we're talking about the editing process. You know, someone could be giving a financial statement at Reuters on video and edited to take the word don't when, when you're talking about investing, right? So is the ability to change the original content and the raw content more worrying? Is, is, that, is that capability there? So that, you know, if you've got an archive of 50 years and someone goes in and changes the archive and changes the raw files and the original footage, to me, to that, that's ben, more a technological worry as well, uh, as, as well as this manipulation and the synthesized stuff. There's a brilliant article last month in MIT Technology Review about deep fake casting, where the people who are making deep fakes are now look, looking for people who can do very convincing, um, you know, uh, portrayals of a, a person and their voice, uh, you know, because of the voice technology they were using in a particular experiment, they wanted someone who had a similar voice or could make themselves mm -hmm. sound like that person um and and interestingly one of the really really compelling cases was exactly what you were just saying nick where they create a new nixon speech regarding the moon landing the historical context was that there was a speech prepared in case things went wrong on the moon and the crew weren't able to get back it was never obviously done and, and nixon never did that speech but the speech exists and what they did was recreate it if you google it it's very easy to find and and it's actually really interesting because Exactly as you said, you're changing the historical record there of something like 60 years ago, yeah. very convincingly. Um, and, and the problem we've got is that, you know, that could be going on kind of quietly without really knowing. So there's two components of making sure that things aren't manipulated. We look at new stuff like contemporary footage of, you know, for instance, the election. We want to make sure everything we see on the news right now is real. But what if we're going back to the archive and the archive itself has been manipulated and, you know, in, in a certain amount of time, no one's going to really remember that who was there. So no. then you start pulling these things out and saying, hold on a minute, the whole crew actually died on the moon. So why is it we're being told the moon landing was successful? You right. know, obviously, mm. that's not the case. But, you know, at some point, this could be a real risk. Like I do have to bring up Marshall McLuhan. The medium is the message. I'm seeing it on, an, on a platform of whatever that is, social media. Oh, God. Um, television, that kind of stuff. So therefore it is true. Yeah. And then at the end of the day, like the technologies, the funny thing is, is that we have huge teams at Adobe that work in, you know, AI and machine learning and that kind of stuff. We all, it's always a kind of a funny joke when you say, oh, it's going to be the Terminator Skynet, AI is going to rule the world, all this kind of stuff. The reality is, is that it's, it's people who can use this technology to change a narrative or a context <laughs> whether that's historical yeah. or now, but the difference is, is that AI and machine learning has made it infinitely easier and more yeah. commoditized and accessible uh, to mere mortals who can use this stuff in a way that has never been able to be used before. Yeah. And that's yeah. where you get into the, the real narrative around, okay, yes, so always gonna be people behind it, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But what checks and balances could there be in place or ways to do things to make it work in a more transparent way? Yep. So. Given that it sounds like deep fake, it really, there's a big difference between entertainment and news and fact and fiction. Given that, does that still mean that editing is the original deep fake? Brilliant or bust? Ben? I'm still leaning towards brilliant or goodish. <laughs> there's no goodish, there's only brilliant or bust, Benjamin, you know that. <laughs> Brilliant-ish. We just made that up. I'm, 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 not going, I'm not going bust on this one. <clears throat> oh, 
Uh, I think movie making is the original deep fake, but we'll take editing as a proxy for that and I'll say brilliant. Steve Ford. I came up with it, so I'm going to say it's brilliant. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> Mr. Sharman. Yeah, I'm going to go with brilliant. And Mr. Pierce. I'm just going to spoil the party and say bust just because I can. Just to be difficult or do you actually have a thing? Well, one to, a bit to be difficult and uh, it isn't just in the editing process. I think it, it is about the underlying technology and what you can achieve by changing, you know, archive footage, which is something we've got a, a lot of background in. The manipulation of that in one way is more worrying to me as, as a, a concept of deep fake than, than someone manipulating stories, which of course is a huge problem in itself. And there you have it. Let's move on to the next grand pronouncement. There are a ton of legitimate uses for the technologies that create deep fake videos. Brilliant or bust? Mr. Ford. What was the intent that created the technology? I mean, you know, coming from the tools side, a lot of the features that we put in Premiere Pro, After Effects, and that kind of stuff over the last you know, several years have really been oriented to enable essentially, for lack of a better term, deep fakes. But at the end of the day, the reason why we did them, I'll use uh, rotoscoping as an example, uh, putting something, cutting things out or putting something into a scene that wasn't originally there. That is mind numbingly tedious work that is fraught with error. And one of the things that when we put a ton of research effort into AI and ML, it wasn't to try to replace the creative. It was really designed just to get rid of the tedious crap that nobody wants to do, you know, really focus back on the creative. The original intent that enables a lot of this kind of crazy town that we're looking at uh, was noble. The idea was to basically come along and say, hey, we can make things like fixing lighting and rig removal and all the other things like fixing things in post was the idea. That though, at the same time with intent, allowed a few other things to happen as well. And Rich, that's, I mean, that's, I've heard you talk quite passionately about, about using tech to, to help storytellers get better quality content out. Presumably this is, um, this is kind of music to your ears, the kind of things that you can do with deep, deep fake tech. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the tools now really are there to help content creators do their job faster and more easily and take the tedious work away. And mm. I think that's where it comes into its own in terms of the legitimate uses. Actually, there's a ton of places where you might want to create whole rafts of stuff that didn't exist legitimately some of the stuff we're looking at right now is things like creative storylines like branching storylines so storylines that change either in uh, in real time in reaction to uh, audience behavior or different input factors that allow you to have different experience every time you see a piece of content and that could be used for instance for personalizing it to uh, an individual and targeted advertising right now is is a little bit crude in in a lot of ways if i buy a pair of trainers i suddenly get bombarded with adverts of trainers like i'm going to need another pair but and you know that's a bit of a cliche but but realistically what the advertisers want to be able to do is have a sports star that I recognize and, and, and like, like Patrick Mahomes, trying to sell me personally a pair of trainers. Uh, sorry, mm. sneakers for the Americans or, or Canadians. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, so, you know, Patrick Mahomes says, hey, Rich, have you thought about buying this pair of amazing Nike sneakers? I might be more inclined to buy them. And, and, and I think those types of things, completely legitimate. Lucasfilm have done it quite a few times. They've brought back um, actors who've sadly passed away and put them into into the movies and again it's completely le legitimate now that does raise a lot of other questions around rights of the actors who are deceased and and when it, it it's morally acceptable to do these things but if you just like look at fairly simple not controversial use cases like advertising i think in that case have at it you know there are loads of places where this could be really like a whole new industry effectively yeah i think they've yeah. been if you look at what's been going on with advertising the last 10 years you know, they've been creating factories to reversion content left right and center and this this is just a legitimate use of helping them in that process to reversion an ad for 20 different markets and languages and also potentially understanding the cultures of the market it's going into to change the language <clears throat> and not just translate it um so you can absolutely see that. I think the, right, the, the issue around rights is really important because rights management seems to be tough enough anyway without worrying about you know, the, the additional concept that so an actor may shoot for a particular piece of content. Are they then going to yeah. get paid for the different mm -hmm. branches that get created? One of the most frustrating things that we always heard from audio professionals was ADR. One of the giant 
quote unquote pains in the ass that people yeah. in post hate, mm -hmm. we're going to try to make that easier. The mm -hmm. challenge though is, is that again, when you take someone who has a different intent that can now use that same technology, again, the specialization, this is the other thing I think that's driving the trend here. Whereas before we were trying to provide ultimate creative flexibility for a user and we expect them to sit down and figure it out for yeah. you know hours, if not months, and become highly specialized in a specific craft. The commoditization of the craft has brought it down to the point where you can achieve many of these things by just typing in text. You could just click a single button and that changes. We've talked about commoditization of technology in, in many, many contexts really over the kind of past 10, 15 years. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Does it, does it devalue a skill or does it, um, does it mean, just mean that the basics of a skill don't have to be learned by those that don't need to learn it? You've got the same argument for should someone be manually copying a tape or yeah. should someone yeah. be manually checking the archive? No, they shouldn't. They should be doing better things with their lives. I think if you were to say deep fake to anyone in the industry is they'll think that deep fake has, is 100% a negative connotation. And this is proving for me that it has its uses and, and, and many varied uses. Effectively, what we're talking about is a, a whole load of different tools that are used to create deep fakes. Mm -hmm. But in fact, it's effectively, it's an art form. Well, like anything I mean, else, it's there's, you can, yeah. you could use your powers for good or you can use your powers for evil. Deep fake, it's a pejorative phrase before you even start, isn't it? It's intended to, to generate negativity. Uh, I'm not sure what phrase we'd use to, to be neutral about it, but, um, but you, you hear deep fake, oh, that's got to be a bad thing. Would we say that it's brilliant or bust that there are a ton of legitimate uses for the technologies that create deep fake? Ben? Brilliant. Brilliant. Everybody's brilliant. 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 Okay. Yeah, yeah brilliant. <laughs> Straight to really, this will be fun. Vendors are responsible for the technology they release. I think everybody on this particular oh, time to go. <laughs> yes, <laughs> makes technology or at least manipulates it heavily. So uh, all of you should have something to say about this. I'm picking on Ben first this time. Well, Let's start with Ben. The 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 phrase that sticks in my head when when I accidentally saw this a minute ago um, <laughs> is uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, guns don't kill people people do oh, and and I think there's a uh, we talked about that news report earlier um, where you know it was arguably deliberately manipulated to support the story they were the narrative they had um, would we say that the the vendor of the editing software um, which I very much doubt was Adobe um was, was used <laughs> um you know was was responsible for doing that i can't think i've ever been in a in a in a product or workflow or development meeting where we consider the moral implications of that which we produce nick now, is it, uh, do, you, do you and john think about that yes and no because um for the first time in our history, we turned down a client because they, they were going to be archiving uh, pretty much hateful content for us to turn. And it was quite a big deal. You know, we're a small company. We'll take that sort of moral stance. You know, someone else will go in and do that, and that's fine. But I think that for us, as a smaller company, we have to be proud to stand up and talk about the customers we've got. And that becomes difficult as we grow because there'll be people with different views across sort of religion, politics, and all the rest of it. Absolutely, there are times when those questions do come up. And I think that ability is a lot easier in a small company, certainly maybe for Object Matrix and for Rich and that, to make a decision whether they want to work with someone or not, right? I mean, I think that's mm. easier. But one of the things I always think about is that when Avatar came out, the world and his mother in the broadcast industry, storage, you name it, was responsible for the making of Avatar, right? Their kit was using Avatar. However, yeah. we're all pretty silent when Osama Bin Laden's videos come out, right? How was it edited? How was it filmed? How was it, um, how was it done? And so ultimately, if we don't release it, someone else is going to pretty quickly. There is an element of vendors are responsible for the stuff they put out occasionally. Um, and I know that there are some vendors who held stuff back. Nick, you hit, you hit the nail on the head for a multi, we're a multi-billion dollar publicly traded company. We make a living selling software. That's, you know, that's how we put food on the table. From a license perspective, what people, somebody does with our software is we can't control that, right? Um, you just, and, you and can't. And to a certain extent, you're so big, how, how could you know what everybody was doing with your software? 
And that's, you know, the EULA, the end user license agreement that everybody clicks when they install the software or use the software specifically says that the company who produces it is indemnified yeah. from whatever you do with it. Um, yeah. Because it's like trying to sue Microsoft or for making Word and somebody writing nasty things in Word, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, it just, it's not possible. That being said, I do think that there is a moral compass. We innovated and we've invested massively in video, audio, and image processing, right? When you look at the number of people that are associated with it, artificial intelligence and machine learning in a company like ours, in a company like Google, in a company like Microsoft, in a company like Blackmagic, I mean, it's not just, you know, in our industry, the people who make the software that, that is the commodity that's used kind of all over the place. Um, this is a primary driver for our future. So as a software vendor, we're gonna invest in this. Um, that being said, yeah. I will be brutally frank. There is times when we go, we should not do that. We are asking ourselves, yeah. just because we can doesn't mean we should. Mm -hmm. And I know that it's not just us. And that's what the foundation is. Once the genie's out of the bottle, you know, I mean, the famous Oppenheimer quote, we are the destroyer of worlds. You, you, can't, you can't hold it back. Right. I mean, once innovation software can happen 50 million different ways and forget the patents protecting you, there's all sorts of different ways to do things. So the reality is, is that what do you choose to do? Do these things called sneaks. It's part of our max conference. Um, and some really, you know, partnered with academia researchers, really cool researchers did this research on it's called project Voco. And it was just, and you can see it online, right? There's the, the sneak is available to do a Google search. Um, and watch it and you'll see how they just manipulate in a text editor. They get somebody to say, and it's their voice, it's their mouth movements, it's everything. Um, and I think that's even what uh, the, the folks at um, South Park did with the Sassy Justice stuff. They use similar type technology uh, to do that. And the interesting thing was, is that we said, we, we cannot release that. Yeah. We will not put that into an editor. That was the first point where we said, well, we gotta start we got to start talking to somebody um, beyond us. And we went over to Google, went across the street, literally here in Seattle, right across the street. <laughs> yeah. um, and, uh, and basically said, hey, we're worried about this stuff. Are you guys worried about this stuff? And then, you know, in context with Facebook, Cambridge Analytica and massive crazes uses of data, they actually mentioned it was one of their number one primary directives was to we can't let we can't put the genie back in the bottle, but maybe this is another area where we need to innovate. We need to come up with technology that can either authenticate, attribute, detect. And I think that's the stuff that's going to massively impact, especially when we think of broadcast workflows or video and audio workflows overall. Um, I'd see a lot of room for innovation there. Rich, is this something that you're kind of thinking about how you build into the, um, the media toolkit? Before we started the company, we spent six months thinking about, amongst other things, the moral question of what we were about to do, because every single tool that we build is designed to eliminate a manual task. You know, our workflows are doing effectively in, in a few minutes, they're doing what normally operators would take weeks to do. And, you know, there's, there's definitely a moral question there about, you know, putting people out of a job effectively. So we, yeah. we had to ask ourselves those questions. We would argue that that frees those people up to do something more interesting. And I have actually sat opposite someone who has pointed out that they lost their job specifically to our software, but it turned out they were now mm -hmm. doing a, a much more interesting job that was in fact what they'd always wanted to do. So that was fine. But I did feel like I dodged a bullet there because that could have been someone who was out of a job and hadn't got a new one. Technology and automation has always done that. And that's not really what we're talking about here. There is a question mark about the responsibility level you have and where that, where, where's that delimited? Because you can't stop people using things for things they weren't meant to. I think it's very different if you manufacture guns and then are surprised when people use them to shoot things. But I think it's different if you're manufacturing you know, a soft toy and that gets used to bludgeon somebody. That's, a, you know, you can't really be the soft toy manufacturer is not responsible for that misuse of their product. And I think we unfortunately sit somewhere in a very difficult gray area <laughs> where we know what we're making may be misused. <clears throat> and, and in most cases, we just have to legally indemnify ourselves against it, which yeah. is, is not a, a, 
a, a great but, way of dealing with it is just pushing the responsibility off. There is a point where you look at what you're doing and say, should we release this to the world? Yes, should, for sure, someone will do it. But do we want to be the people to do it? And I think when you can yeah. make the decision not to do that, that's, that's when you've really stepped up and, and, and proven that you are in it for the right reasons rather than just for money. Um, oh, yeah. But we're a small company, so we want the money, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, one thing, just a really quick, I've been at Adobe for about 10 years, and this was probably one of the most pivotal moments that I have had in my career here. We had just put out a, a product called Premiere Clip. It was our first experiment of a video editor on a phone. Yep. And what we did at the end of it was we would watermark because it was free. I remember I got a call from my boss to come up, and he showed me a video that was produced with Clip, and it was an ISIS beheading video. Mm -hmm. um and at, right at the end of it was the watermark oh, that we created oh. at the end whoops right yeah and i will never forget the feeling of being sick to my stomach yeah you know the fact that the what I, I had created was used for something like that and it it shook a lot of people and sometimes face you know adobe's a big company but there's people behind it right and yeah. one of the things that i think that you try to remember and that's where that moral compass does come from yes there's all the legal ease and the indemnification but there are a lot of people who passionately care about what they build and then when it's used for something like that it just breaks their heart yeah yeah so i guess the flip side of this question really is if we all decided that vendors are actually responsible for the technology they release at least to a point then the flip side of this conversation, which might be a whole nother podcast on another day is, are they still responsible for the technology even if it's not released? It's like once you know the genie's out of the bottle, do you tell anybody that it's out of the bottle or help corral the genie or whatever the metaphors are? You need are. to build That's a, a whole genie nother... detector yeah. if you're gonna do that. I guess for me, just kind of listen to, to Steve's Steve story, which makes a very powerful impression. It's, it's kind of, isn't the flip side of this question that about um, users are actually responsible for the way in which they use the technology that's released? Yeah, I think that the question is going to be very hard to be too brilliant or bust because um, you could almost position it as vendors care about the technology they release because we absolutely do. And, and, you know, it's clear that all the people behind Adobe do. And then what we turn the question into is, are all of us humans responsible for our own behavior? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yes. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's brilliant. That's, that's pretty uh, evident right now, isn't it, in the US? <laughs> yeah, this is a heck of a good line of thought for us in this industry to keep thinking about, that's for sure. But let's jump into the next topic and see what that's about. There are technology solutions that can prove what the original content was. Is that brilliant or is it a bust? Well, there are, but I'm not sure that they're practically going to help because it's already manipulated many times on its way and i fear that the ways in which you might protect it um to prove what the original was it could easily be broken but i think there's a worse problem here once you've seen it even if someone tells you afterwards that it was a fake and um, we've seen this with fake news in particular um it, it doesn't matter because you've already you're you're you've already made up your mind about that thing. And even when you consciously know yeah. that the information you were given was, was incorrect, inaccurate, or just false, uh, in most cases, you've made the uh, uh, underlying decision uh, anyway, and you can't, your mind can't be changed on that. I think, Rich, that, that, that's fine for social media and broadcast and all the rest of it, but um, video technology is used in thousands of other ways in the corporate world in the legal world in the fine in the finance and medical world whereby um they will come back to that evidence so you're absolutely right that once we've seen it it's it's you know corrections mean nothing you know even in the uk legal cases with the jeremy kyle show who wants to be a millionaire with the coughing colonel or captain or whatever he was they had to go back to the original studio footage to work out you know was there some sort of collusion uh in that case um Video is used uh, up and down the country and, and, and globally by law enforcement uh, to, uh, to and in legal cases. So having a way of ensuring that the original raw footage can be proven to be authentic is super important and has relevance. We all know that it's, very, it's almost impossible to engineer security into a system that's, that isn't designed to be secure. Haven't we, got, haven't we almost passed the point where we can inject technology into 
call it a video supply chain, whichever way you want to, in, in any context, where we can actually, where we can prove the, um, the veracity of the content at every different stage. It, it, are, are, we, are we arguing about something that, that can't be done? It's a thing that absolutely can be done. We have technology now that we use to, um, to talk about the, but the originality of clips are just to track the history of clips and where they've been through a system. Um, and that totally exists. Thank you very much uh, <laughs> for genealogy, genealogy. So that absolutely exists, and they're tools that are really, really useful. But how uh, how could we apply that? And I think that goes to Rich's point: is yeah, what, what what is the impact of that? Even if you certify something as truthful at some point, how do you maintain that, and what impact does that have downstream? I think there's also a second issue. There is obviously there's there's a good reason to mark some things as as truthful and all the rest of it. But at what point? Once something's been manipulated, does that become the truth? Yeah. We're not capturing everything about a scene when we capture the original video, are we? We're capturing a snapshot. Visually edit something out just by pointing the wrong way. Steve, I mean, Adobe has put huge investments into, um, into, into kind of video supply chain. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, the first thing that everybody did when we were like, oh, hell, we got to figure out how to innovate in this territory was can we automatically detect when something has been manipulated? I'd be frank, we haven't found that yet. <laughs> I doubt we ever could. And if there was some magic recipe that came out of nowhere that could do that, it would probably have a very limited shelf life. To do this kind of proof of original content uh, and the strategy that a lot of the research effort has been around at Adobe is trying to prove authenticity via metadata, go in um, and do attribution, try to agree with many other people outside of us and what those metadata standards should be from that point of view. And then how do you then harden it, right? So that it comes into a state where it shouldn't be manipulated. We're a commodity software vendor where, you know, like Premiere Pro is essentially the word of our industry. We kind of try to figure out how do we do this at the scale of, you know, somebody who has plunked their credit card down and, you know, they have Premiere Pro and After Effects and, and that kind of stuff, right through to professional workflows that are ensconced in, in large enterprises, not just mm -hmm. in broadcast as well, right? So just as Nick, you pointed out, um, our tools are used in finance and defense and security all in government matched along with pdf you wouldn't believe the amount of use you know in, in that kind of stuff if i was to say that there's a strong investment area at adobe it's this one broadcast is and always has been a little bit behind the curve with it right you know our background has been digital preservation for military finance health data and it's all about making sure content's immutable and findable mm -hmm. and proving that authenticity. Ever since Enron went mad with the shredder, the, the desire to have authentic content, whether it's a check image, uh, an MRI scan or whatever, has been top of the list because people will get sued if they can't find an email. They will get sued if a doctor diagnosed an, an MRI wrongly. And therefore, having that authentic content as, or, or um, data has always been super important. So systems and billions and billions of pounds and dollars have been spent designing and building and buying these systems that make sure that they are authentic. Technologies are there, it's just how do you build them into a workflow that makes sense? Yeah. Well, I just think there's one other factor that we really need to be very conscious of, because if broadcast is behind the curve of IT, IT is behind the curve of hacking. And, and the problem we got is that we can spend billions on protecting stuff. It only takes one hacker to get lucky to break a system and then that's out there. Um, yeah. And then you then you're hunting down another technology that can't be broken and that will get hacked. And so now I don't mean to be a doom monger or anything, but I do think it could easily, you know, we can be chasing something that, for a very long time here. One thing I'll just riff off of what you said, Nick, though, that gives me a lot of hope, not to tell tales out of school, but when I joined Adobe 10 years ago, making the argument for video technology at the commodity scale of an Adobe was a very uphill battle. Photoshop yeah. is our verb. PDF is our, our lingua franca of the foundation, frankly, of the business. Video is eating the world. So as proliferation of video content in social media, in other industries, fast forward to today, video is one of the largest investment areas of not just us, but every other big com big tech company you want to talk about, which means that the level of investment, and it's just riffing off of what you said, Nick, that, you know, broadcast was all, always a bit of a laggard, you know, and this kind of stuff. Let's be frank, it's, it was a niche industry. Mm. Um, yeah. It was a niche industry in the grand scheme of things, yep. but now it's not. It is now turning into the lingua franca of humans on earth. Yep. Yep. And therefore, now the investment that's coming into our world is going to dramatically change. Uh, and I think yeah. that's, there's no putting a cap on that genie either. <laughs> putting the genie back in that yeah. bottle either. You've just, you've just rewritten the front page of our website. Thanks, Steve.
<laughs> yeah, you can pay me a You get gear. a marketing consulting check in the mail. <laughs> it was out of the... There are technology solutions that can prove what the original content was. Brilliant or bust, Mr. Mr. Pierce. Brilliant from me. Charmin. I'm going to go bust. Good answer. <laughs> Mr. Ford. <laughs> <It's not. laughs> I'm going to go bust right now. I think it's oh. going to take a lot of investment, but I think there needs to be a lot more invested here. Ms. Ralph? What he said. Okay. Uh, bust, because even if there is, it's going to get broken. Yeah, that's Mr. Great. Davenport? <laughs> <laughs> that's I'm cheating. Say, there's that's... a lot of noise in the background, but I've given my answer. <laughs> Which was? <laughs> no, I totally agree with Rich. Um, yeah, bust. Wow. God, I'm on my own again. <laughs> yeah. Well, you wanted to be contrary. You got your wish. And I have been. There we go. Next. Regulations to prove authenticity and historical tracking of media through workflows is the only way to combat deep fake tech from being used nefariously. Brilliant or bust? The, the only statement I would say is that um, the only way that um, many of the IT businesses and industries got their, uh, began to get their house in order, and admittedly they can get hacked, which you're absolutely right, is that they, they had to adhere to industry standards and regulations in order to play the game. And in our industry, which has been a niche, as Mr. Ford rightly says, standards have been anything but a standard. There are some areas where news and factual regulation does actually lead to innovation in, in some cases, and that can drive the advancement of better workflows and better security of content going forward as as to steve's point and you know scattergun approach typically doesn't work when you're trying to unite an industry so i think regulations can focus the mind on on what, what needs to be fixed first regulation tends to fall so far behind uh, the advance of technology we actually have a very strong regulatory um, regime in the uk that guides a lot of broadcast television but trying to get regulators and legislators to keep up with that when it comes to say social media which is now how way too many people actually get their news um has, has proven um, an almost impossible conundrum so again you know should we even bother i think that's that's we'll the say, point should we bother right i mean the the wording of the question it might be the point might be brilliant it might be the only way to combat it but actually it could also make the situation worse okay keeping rushes is one thing but i mean how much news gathering i mean it's it's not just now gathering by the news organizations is it they get loads of contributed content from all sorts of places so if they have to validate all of that kind of content coming in um the chances are just because of the practicalities of producing news programs they're not going to use it um, therefore, that content is never going to go through the regulations. They're going to go through the channels that either ignore regulations or somehow subvert the law or just aren't, aren't applied to. And it's going to make the situation worse. Well, I was just also thinking through, because I worked in the news industry for about six years, and then I went to sports. And if you think about it, both of those are fact-based in the moment uses of video technology, right? But both of them are manipulated without using that in a negative term, but in a technical term, both of those industries manipulate content all the time to illustrate a point. So for me, what it comes back to is kind of the personal responsibility slash training in things like journalism, where you go through and understand what ethics are and you understand um, exactly what manipulation means. Maybe the next phase of this is that you're not just having journalistic integrity in the words that you say or the words that you write, but in how you edit. So I remember we used to have about six shots in at the television station I worked for in the South of a house burning. And every time we had a house burning in the news, we used one of those six houses every single time <laughs> for six years. <laughs> and so is that not telling the truth? Well, yeah, that house really wasn't on fire. But on the other hand, a house burning is a house burning is a house burning for the most part, especially at night. <laughs> so, so all of that comes back to, you know, is regulation about the technology or is the regulation about training humans to be able to be critical thinkers? To your point, if I wanted to do that today and I was your news channel, I could go on Google Street View, get a shot of the real house that was apparently burning, and then use After Effects to make the fire. 
yeah. and do a yeah. pretty convincing job. Sure. Yeah. For the purposes exactly. of a few seconds shot on the news. Exactly. Uh, you know. So was that authentic? Richard, Richard no. Wright, vir virtual arsonist. Well, but <laughs> in the context, it's been said the context before. of what we're talking about, you created original authentic content. Yeah. From a metadata mm. perspective. <laughs> I think well, exactly. Does that mean that we can no longer have those up. little sketches of the person in court? Because, you, you know, we're not allowed to have, you know, we don't have cameras in court in the UK. So we have the little artist's impression. Is yeah. that artist impression now no longer valid in this in this we, scenario? We do. Rich, make we, have judge, we have Judge Rinder. <laughs> you know the interesting, the the funny thing about regulations when you think about it, I'll kind of hark back to the the fact that again, video is eating the world, right? It's hmm. it's the it's becoming the lingua franca of this planet. And when something like that happens, and I'll just kind of hark back to something that I think that I actually think caused a momentous shift in a different medium for a different reason. And that's GDPR. Mm -hmm. um, when GDPR came in, the whole world shook when GDPR came in. Even though it was relevant for Europeans, yeah. um, everybody else had to react to it. Information sets context. Context drives people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and if, if I could see a world one day where you, know, you have something like that, and I think that's where going back for us with workflows and technology, um, I, I just keep coming back to, you know, metadata and things like that, somehow agreeing as a standard. Well, our industry isn't so great at that. But um, if there's some regulation that forced it, something akin to like a GDPR, you could see that change in things dramatically in the future. In my background of working for um, AT&T and Bell Labs, if your kit didn't adhere to a standard or a protocol, it wasn't joining the network, right? It had to be certified by a, an international body that sort of ratified the standards and that was it. You, your kit just didn't get on the network. I think the point about GDPR is a good one. It, it'll, mm -hmm. it'll happen because something in the US will happen like antitrust with Google or, or um, Amazon or whatever, because something bad has happened in video and it'll come from a political stance, not a technology uh, stance. I just think people will find a way around it and they'll fake yeah. things yeah. other ways. How long did regulators at the, um, on either side of the Atlantic spend going after, uh, going after Microsoft and they still no, never managed to quite get them to unbundle internet yep. out, of, um, out of Windows. So it's, you know, it, it, I think Rich is right. I think people, people find a way around it. Regulations to prove authenticity and historical tracking of media through workflows is the only way to combat deep fake tech from being used nefariously. Brilliant or bust. Mr. Pierce. I'm going to say bust purely because it's not the only way, but I do think it will happen. Mr. Sharman? Bust partly because of what Nick said as well in terms of, um, in terms of it's not the only way, but also I just think uh, I'm, I am deeply skeptical about regulators' ability to keep up with technology. Mr. Ford? I'm th times three, bust. Regulation takes time. Um, it'll happen, some, something will happen in the future, but yeah. not, not right now. Rich? Bust. I mean, faking stuff is already illegal. We don't need regulation to make it more illegal. <laughs> ben? Yeah, it's, it's bust. Even if it was the only way, it wouldn't work. All right. So now I'm going to get all crazy and introduce a conundrum to see what you all have to say. The conundrum is nobody in the media industry will ever agree on any kind of standards. Nick's favorite thing. But to address deep fakes, storage has to be immutable so metadata can never be the basis of tracking data manipulation. I don't, I don't know why anybody worries about this. We'll just put it into, uh, into the MXF um, standard. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, to be fair, no, hold, yeah. hold on. I'm going to counterpoint that. I agree with, the, with you on MXF without any question that you know a standard anyway can be corrupted. So even if you do agree on it, the standard could be so loose it doesn't make any difference. I think a different type of standard would be something like a mathematical algorithm that is, you know, that's not, that's not a standard as such, that's just a mathematical truth. Math, and actually yeah. using maths, we can make things immutable. We use a technology even in our software, which is like off the shelf maths, that allows us to absolutely detect whether we have duplicates and or changes to any single component that's being stored and being used in our system. So we, we know for sure if someone's changed something and we know for sure if we've got more than one copy of something. I, 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 hate, to use your own, 
I, I hate to use your own words against you, but someone's going to break that, right? And um, someone has broken <laughs> yeah, it. The, the, birthday, the birthday paradox, where a piece of content can have the same digital fingerprint, like two MD5. Ah, oh, but right? yeah, and, but we don't use MD5 because of that very there are, reason. There are many, many people in a large com country somewhere that are just trying to break shit like this all the time, right? Trying to disprove sure. SHA, try to disprove we'll, SHA-1 and SHA-2. And then we yeah. move to elliptical, when quantum computing comes along, we move to elliptical key cryptography and so on. You can step ahead of that, um, it's, but it's not, I mean, like no one's broken SHA-512 right now. So <laughs> you say that, but and maybe- But they will, future, right? But for now I mean, it works. They will. Yeah, and they will. And then we move to another one. We, we used to use MD5, as Nick rightly says, it's easily breakable. And it's actually a, a super weak spot in some of the commonly used, um, you know, encryption uh, that we use in various bits of the media supply chain anyway. Mm. So actually, you know, we do have to keep moving, but that doesn't mean we can't use the best of what's available now um, and then just move to the next thing when it comes along. And that actually isn't a big burden from a processing point of view. It's certainly not a big burden from a storage point of view. You're not storing huge amounts of extra data to determine whether something's immute, you know, has been changed or manipulated. So it's not metadata because it's derived from the actual content itself. Um, it is immutable, at least at this moment in time. And I really believe that the next, that there are other technologies that you could move to if this fails. So I think this actually can be done. Um, and it's better than using a, a standard as such, a media industry standard at least, because those are, you know, they're, they're difficult and, and I, I'm not sure I agree that nobody ever agrees on them. But the problem is there's interpretation and there's usually a whole bunch of different ways in which you can actually use that standard, which means they're not necessarily compatible. I guess my point that the industry never agrees on something is the MXF joke. Um, you know, we have AS11 in, in the UK for delivery and the French have AS10, right? And, and that's never going to change. And so it's kind of like, until there is a, an agreement that for content that we have a shared piece of metadata, even just one piece, I think that it's going to be very hard to, to uh, really build this sort of authenticity and ensuring that something is authentic from the beginning, from the glass right through to the, its life in the archive. I mean, what, what, you're, um, what you're talking about there is, is, is actually within a world garden, everything will be absolutely fine because, um, because you'll use some of these stuff from end to end and, um, and it'll be fine. It's when you get back into it, if you're trying to have an inter interoperable um, yeah. supply chain and, and, uh, and, and do what we're doing now, which is trying to pull the best pieces from the best vendors. Let's face it, the whole reason that MXF is so broken is the book's fine, but each of the you know the, the last few chapters of the the book are um, about different vendors describing how they implement it just slightly differently <laughs> so, um, we we design incompatibility into our system i mean you're talking about an industry that has written the book out of how to be completely dysfunctional when it comes to standards <laughs> like our entire industry one of the things that's interesting though and the reason why it's been so bloody dysfunctional is because at the end of the day it's been you know made this reference earlier it's a niche industry and I'm not, when yeah, it's a niche yeah. industry, and that's all the way from Hollywood, feature film, through to broadcast, through to social media, um, it is a really small business, right? And so everybody who makes technology in this business has been motivated, frankly, to screw up everybody else's standard, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. that creates it's competitive competition, advantage. competition, right? Right. Yeah. When things transition, though, out of being a niche industry into a mainstream communication model then the game changes right and i think yeah. that that will have an impact on yeah. how standards bodies operate how you know regulations if they ever come in the future will drive those and then how companies when even though they co-op you know there's coopetition <laughs> right in this context yeah. i think it'll be very different than the, the world we've been used to for the last yeah. god knows millennia you know i think you're really right about scale i think scale taking this little teeny tiny niche industry, relatively speak to the impact it has in the world, I don't think even we think about and really uh, take in how, how few people make this incredibly powerful industry 
function across the world. And you're right, now that it's become ubiquitous, the tools are on every phone, on, on every device, we're all carrying around things to capture video content. You're right, the scale just exploded. So that's yeah. gonna ultimately affect everything we're talking about from what does yeah. competition mean? What does responsibility mean? What does technology mean? We're gonna be like you know, the telephone company. Everybody has to have one and there right. has to be all these extra rules maybe. We, I mean, we've been making Premiere Pro for 28 years, right? Yeah. It's been around a long time. So for a piece of 28 year old software, we've grown that thing. I mean, we're, we're over 50% growth this year, you know, in, for a product that's been around for a long time, that's in technology that's yeah. never heard of. And that yeah, just yeah, shows the incredible. transition to the industry. Nobody in the media industry will ever agree on any kind of standard. Brilliant or bust, Nick? Uh, brilliant, because they won't. <laughs> Steve? I have a problem with ever. I'm going to go with bust. Rich? Uh, I'm going to say bust. They, they can agree on some standards, just not all of them. Yeah. Ben? Yeah, no, I, I'm going to agree with bust, because it says any kind of standard. So I think there's a, <laughs> there's, there's a big loophole in that. <laughs> Mr. Ford? I'm going to uh, mix alone again this time. I'm going bust as well. I don't think it will ever. I think some, we agree on some stuff, but not much. I think, well, which is all <laughs> ironic if you think about it, because the point of a standard is that there's not an either or, it's yes or no. We can't even agree on whether or not there will be standards, which tells you something about the standardizing body process. Do you mean yes or yes? I don't know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so the second part of the conundrum is, but to address deep fake, storage has to be immutable. So metadata can never be the basis of tracking data manipulation. How oh, losers would make their storage immutable? Oh, goodness only knows. Yeah, goodness I'm, I'm going to go brilliant. I'm going to slightly tweak it to say that the content has to be immutable somehow. <laughs> but the metadata, I agree, metadata can't be the basis of tracking data manipulation because the metadata can be manipulated. That is an acceptable asterisk answer. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have an asterisk answer? I, I'll, I'll add an asterisk answer. I think the metadata as we know it today, I agree. It won't be the basis, but I think it's got to change. That's beautifully asterisk. I'll, I'll go with that as well. <laughs> okay, so the brilliant is on the asterisk, not the statement. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys all very, very much for doing this today. I think this is a good one. This will be fun. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you taking the time. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Have a good week. Good to see everybody. Okay, so clearly nobody liked the straight question on this last one. No, indeed. On this podcast, I've been outvoted on, on most of the topics. Yes. Yes, you were outvoted on most of the topics, but someone out there listening somewhere agrees with you. I'm sure of it. I, I really hope so. Yeah, so it's pretty clear that we're only scratching the surface of what kind of effect video and video technology is, is having in the world. I love what Steve Ford said about the commoditization of video. You know, those of us that have been in the industry this long, it's really kind of weird, at least for me, to realize he's right. You know, this little tiny niche industry of a, a couple few thousand people, so many people across the world with a device that's in their pocket can do what used to take us forever to accomplish. A couple of really interesting points for me, you know, certainly in the pursuit of making things easier and more efficient for the editing and creative process. We've created technology that has really changed how people perceive video uh, and what they believe or not. I think it was Steve uh, Sharman that said that the term is really a negative term, deep fake, and people instantly think it's negative, but yep. there's a bunch of things that it does that's really helpful uh, in the creative process. Yep. But also, you know, that it isn't just about the broadcast industry. Uh, video, as Steve Ford says, is eating the world and it's in uh, defense, it's in medical, it's in banking, it's in, it's all in every sphere of business and our industry this niche industry we have um we're building the tools that are going to so, sort of power those global workflows yeah but we also are really in effect also the leaders into how to think about the moral and ethical and critical thinking exercises we should all be going through as we jump into this brave new world of video everywhere uh, thank you very much to everyone who joined us today. Uh, we really appreciate your time and your thoughts. 
we'd love to continue the conversation with our listeners on the WIG LinkedIn group. So if you're not a member, go over and sign up. It'd be great to get your feedback, comments, and questions from anything we've discussed today or any suggestions for future podcast series. So yeah, please do get in touch. Great. Thanks, Nick. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Today's WIG Talks Brilliant or Bust podcast was sponsored by Vidispine, cloud-based media workflow solutions to maximize your media potential. Zixi, the global leader in broadcast quality live video over IP. Object Matrix, the cloud storage people who provide platforms that enable creative and production teams with self-serve access to media content on-premise or remotely from anywhere. Today's contributors were Hawthorne Innovation, helping bring the power of modern artificial intelligence and the cloud to bear on story production, content supply chains, and media systems integration. And Christy King LLC, a media technology consultancy and content creator.